So good evening and welcome um, to the anti-racist book and film series here um, at Harvard University. And this series is a, a co-sponsorship with HUGSI, the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, Office of Diversity, and with uh, Charles Hamilton Institute at Harvard um, and with Harvard Libraries. So tonight's uh, second of in their series of films, and it's they're being shown now every other Wednesday. So we hope that you'll join us for them. I'll put the host in the chat um, for you. Um, and I'd like to just welcome you and thank our, our sponsors and, and acknowledge David Harris and what a wonderful partnership this has been. So David. So thank you, Sarah. I just, and again, I want us to get to, we're gonna roll the film very soon, very quickly. And I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody and, and and say, you know, we're really fortunate tonight. We have a, a great film. I think you all are going to love it if we can get above these doorbells. <laughs> and, uh, um, you, know, you know, I think we're really especially pleased and blessed that we have with us two discussants for after the film. Folks, uh, um, most of you, many of you on, I can, I know, know uh, Barbara Fields and Donna Bivens, two of our, 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 our local treasures and, and, and really, uh, 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 you know, kind of important voices for us to, to listen to as we think about and reflect on the film. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I noticed, you know, I have to call him out, you know, Judge Harris tells me that he was, that we have to look for him in this film, that he was there in Chicago uh, during this boycott. So uh, and we all know that, that Judge Harris uh, is everywhere, but we didn't know he was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really, really pleased about that and the conversation to follow. And as Sarah said, you know, this is part of a series. And I did just want to say that the next film we see will be a film called an Uncom The Uncomfortable Truth. An Uncomfortable Truth. It's a it's a story of a it's a story uh, by a filmmaker who set about to make a film about the history of slavery in this country and discovered that his family was part of that history. Uh, and uh, it's a powerful, powerful film. And, and for discussion on that, we're going to have uh, Tamara Lanier, Tammy Lanier, Tamara who Lanier. many of you many may recognize, may recognize the great, 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 great I think, I think. Uh, uh, granddaughter uh, of Papa Renti, uh, who was an enslaved person. person. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, she uh, has, quite, has a, quite, a quite a story to tell. So I think that's going to be also a very uh, wonderful experience. experience. Um, so, so I so think I the think other thing I have to say, I have to I make, have to make a statement to all of you that this is being recorded. Our conversation will, will be recorded, and uh, I have to put you on notice that that's the case. And uh, you don't want to be recorded. Obviously, you don't have to say anything. Um, so, uh, I think that's it, Sarah. I think we should just. just I have one other thing just to say is that the film is only about 30 minutes, so don't go too far um, and, and please stay with us afterwards. So I would love to, to for you to be here for the discussion for the panel. And then I did want to announce that I'll drop in the chat that Harvard Libraries also has the film streaming for individual use. So if you want to share it again, watch it again, see it again, um, I'll put my contact information as well as Harvard Libraries link if you want to watch that um, just through your library card. And then Sarah, one other thing, I'm sorry, because I have to give thanks and praise to, to Coco Rosenberg for the work that she did. You know, she's not here, but, but she really has been critical for this entire series. To my colleague, my colleague Kelly Garland, Garland, who has stepped in and, and, and helped that as well. And, uh, you know, some of us are kind of in the Zoom, but, but, but Coco and Kelly, you know, joined Sarah in making this happen. So I want to give them a shout out. So, uh, Sarah, if we can roll the film. Well, <laughs> uh, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for uh, screening that. Uh, it's, now, somebody said earlier there was an echo. Is there still an echo with my voice? Okay. Um, so, you know, catch our breaths a little bit. And uh, um, uh, you know, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I know, you know there's so much in it, you know, to, to take out and, and carry with us. Um, uh, you know, I want to turn to uh, 
to uh, Donna Bivens and Barbara Fields, our, our, uh, our, uh, our esteemed discussants today, um, to get a sense just, just initially, I kind of am curious about your, your first impressions, if there are particular things about this film, about this story, about this history that was depicted there that, that struck you. Uh, obviously, some things resonate, but I'm curious. I mean, just what, what's, your, what's your first response to, to, to what we just saw? Barbara? I guess my first response is, and it comes with a bit of sadness that we are still very much at the same place. Even though I can experience some joy in the fact that our communities have continued to fight, that we have not given up on the quest of getting for our children what they need and deserve. But as I look at it, it makes me, what came through to me mostly was, this appears to be almost like a playbook uh, of what the nation and those that would prefer our children not to learn are all doing. As I look at what went on in Chicago, and then I look at what went on in Boston, you know, it's basically the same things. We can change the names of the players. We can change the name of the different schools. Uh, in BEAM, I'm a member of the Black Educators Alliance of Massachusetts, and we had a retreat, and we were going through the, we did a historical timeline. And when I look at this, I look at in, in 1963, uh, they're having the boycott in Chicago, and, and the kids are walking out of schools. And I look at 1964 in Boston, we're experiencing the same situation where the black teachers and the, and the community decided they were going to do uh, stay out of school. Chicago called it freedom schools. And in Boston, it was freedom schools. There was a teacher that was a part of our retreat who was also involved in the walkout. And she talked about the role of black teachers at that time and how black teachers had been somewhat afraid to to even be seen together. It was a, a founding of BEAM. At that time, uh, it was called the Negro Educators. I have the right, um, the, the right name. Uh, but in, anyway, um, they were afraid to really come together. And often when they did, it went so far as sometimes you hear Gene McGuire talking about pulling down the shade in the room in which they were meeting. But then it evolved into, because of the, the strength and the determination of the Black educators and working with, with people such as Ruth Batson and, and, and Jean McGuire and others within the community, uh, James Breeden, that they organized. And what happened was the Black teachers decided they were going to stay out too. And those who stayed out, and I believe there was like 10,000 children who stayed out in 64. Uh, and they had the freedom schools and they did the same thing that Chicago did in that the, some kids stayed at home and others went to the freedom schools and they taught the children then. They sang songs, they taught them freedom songs. Uh, they taught more about their history and their culture. It's the same parallel, you see the same things happening but they're also responding to the discrimination and the segregation and the withholding of resources to schools so that parents have to go through this to try to get an education for their children. So we can go on up through the years, a part in the film talked about 2013, the closing of schools. Well, in Boston in 2010, you know, they closed you know, eight schools, wanted to close 10 but the two schools that had more white children in it, the parents complained and they left those schools open. So you're seeing the same things happening in New York, you're seeing it happening in Chicago and Boston. So that's why I say it's almost like a playbook, you know, because I, don't, I know it's not by accident that every city seems to be doing the same things in our urban, our black communities, 
you know, from the South to here, what is their issue with not wanting to educate our children? And so that sort of struck me in what I would say a sad way, because we're still experiencing the same thing today, the same fights, the same issue at the school committee meeting in Boston tonight. You know, it's the same issues. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's very sobering. Donna, do you have some thoughts too? Yes, I I felt the same way that Barbara did. It was just it was just so sobering to see the the comparisons with what was happening in Boston back then. I wasn't in Boston at that time, uh, and what was happening in uh, Chicago, um, and 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 what's happening now. So. Um, you know, just the, the overcrowding that was going on in, in, for, for Black children, um, all the things in, in Judge Garrity's order that he tried to address, that, 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 that we tried to address, that, um, that, that, that never really got addressed. So it, it's just so, it's, I think it's so clear how deeply, and I, I think the good thing about now is that People are really seeing the deep systemic nature of this that never saw it before. I mean, most people live it, most of us live it every day, but I think there's just an opening now that people are beginning to see the systemic nature of it. And at the same time, with the pandemic, with the, you know, and the, the, um, the economic and racial um, crises that came along with it, um, it you know, it's, it's sobering. And I think, to, <laughs> I, I told you I, I was afraid to do this because I feel like I've become Debbie Downer. I don't want to do that. I think that um, what was inspiring to me was, um, was, was just how we show up, how Black people show up and, and allies and accomplices show up to do this work. I love that at the end they had um, thank you for the, your feedback and, and and encouragement over the years. So just you know, this summer I I had the the privilege of um, interviewing people all over the all over the country about their anti-racism work. And one thing that was really inspiring to me, well, it was a hard time because it was right after George Floyd and. People were really, you know, really traumatized and everything. But the one thing that was really inspiring was there were spots, this is for a mainline church, where people had worked from the 50s to now. They were they they just kept doing it. And um, I just I just I mean, when you, this is so at the root of this country that the that the thing is is that you just have to keep going. I, I one quote I have from this woman Ruth King who says that. The practice of freedom is showing up every day, and I think that that's what people who do this, who who do this, people like Barbara and Bean, who've been who, who've been doing this for decades, have to do. And 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 and, and younger people are you know, are joining in the intergenerational work around this. It's 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 ongoing. Yeah, it's, you know, it's 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 interesting because one of the very early on, it was fascinating to hear um, the, uh, one of the parents describe sending the children to school in shifts, and and that was eerily that. So Judge Harris, is, uh, he's going to talk to us about that in a minute, I think. But but it was deeply resonant with the response to COVID, right? I mean, you know, when I when I saw, I thought, oh my goodness. You know, it's a it's a very similar thing, and that 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 those shifts kind of pro, kind of promote inequities in their own ways, and um, and that that to me was was really uh, profound. Um, but I wanted to ask you on and Judge Harris, I do want you. I I put in a chat. I asked you if you wanted to uh, to chat, but I do want you to say something in a minute. But I, but one of the questions I have is. <clears throat> You know, in, in, in 63 and 64, this was happening in many parts of the country. That, that, that was an important thing. And, and, and the question is, 
you know, here we are in the 21st century. Um, and as, as Barbara said, you know, this stuff is happening. These cities, it looks like a playbook. These things are, are happening all over the country. And the, one of the questions is how do we think about finding what, the, you know, these are local issues on some level, but to the extent that they're systemic issues that happen in every city, they become national issues. How do we think about addressing these issues locally, but also kind of thinking about if, you know, some kind of movement that allows us to tie these threads together. And so, so I'm curious if, if you all have thoughts about that and if you think it's possible, right? If it's all, if it all has to be local, local school boards, local budgets, local this, that, or the other. Um, I, I think it's, it's a national issue that must be dealt with locally and nationally. Because I think if we look at the policies that are you know, promoted nationally, when we look at the whole piece around standardized testing, when we look at what I would call the whole uh, effort to, um, to privatize the schools, when I look at all the monies that Pearson you know, publishing company gets for uh, promoting, you know, these tests. And I look at now during the pandemic and our children across this country have experienced trauma. They've experienced deaths. They've been in schools, uh, you know, not as many days as we know they should be, nor are they getting the kind of instruction that they should be getting when you look at remote learning. And you hear the teachers talk about how difficult that is. And yet we see other portions of the community, pretty much your, your wealthier white students, their, their instruction is not being interrupted in the same way. You know, they are in their schools, they're in the private schools, they are, their education is continuing. And yet we say that we're trying to deal with an opportunity gap. Well, we had an opportunity gap before the pandemic. So just think of what kind of a gap we have now when our kids have been a year without instruction. And then I think the other thing that the pandemic has done is really exposed in a more public way, the inequities, the disparities that have always been there. And now they have become even enlarged with kids not being in schools and with parents not being able to go to work. So as they said in that film, it ties in the whole issue of education and housing, employment, the whole wealth gap. I mean, all this stuff has been crystallized and I'm an optimistic in some ways, I believe that we can deal with it. I believe that we can turn this around, but I think what has to happen is a sense of awareness, educating the public, letting people see, and I'm talking about our people, see more fully what this all means for the future of our race, for our children. You know, is this pandemic actually playing into what I refer to as a playbook, meaning, you know, our kids not getting the kind of education they need to get anyway, and we're able to do that. You know, they claim we don't have the resources. We have the resources, but we don't value black children enough to put the resources there. So again, getting back to Boston that I know better than anything else, we're looking at the budget. And here we are talking about cutting the budget when we need to be providing resources and services to our children. So I think it's the, our community, we were able to elect two senators down in Georgia. We put our minds to it, we can do a lot. We put Biden in the White House. You know, it's time for some payback. It's time for our schools and our children to get the resources they need. And I think it's on us to insist, you know, that that happens. And if we use the model that was used in 63, where people came together, you know, they marched, they did what they need to do. They organized the same here in Boston in 64. You know, now in Boston, it ended up in court. And we had Judge Garrity, who gave 400 orders around everything from how kids are disciplined to the security in the schools, to the hiring of Black teachers, to partnerships with colleges and universities 
to bring additional resources to the empowerment of parent councils and parents have a say in the schools and making the district give the parents a budget, you know, so they can do their work. 400 orders. And we did see some changes, but the school department, as soon as it could, little by little, has chipped that away until now we see a great decrease in the number of Black teachers. We move more to a segregated school. And just so that we're real clear, the DSAFE order was not about integration. It was about our kids having exposure to the resources that were in other schools. So if you go to that school, then you're bound to, to you know, receive it. Now, what it could not deal with is institutional racism. And that's here as strong as it was then. And when we look across our nation, it seems like it's even stronger or maybe it's more exposed. So yes, I think that it's something that we can do, but I think it means we have to organize, 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 and educate, 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 so we all see the big picture because knowledge is power. And if people don't know, then they don't know how to use the power that they have. I know you don't disagree with that, Donna. <laughs> Not at all. I, to I totally agree with it. Yeah. You know, there was a piece and of- I, I think also what Barbara was saying is that, you know, we were talking about this the other day. I think it's real, it's so interesting to see daily back then or focusing on Willis. And we focus on individuals, which I think is important, but, and at the same time, um, it, it is a system. And so you get rid of one person, but, but, but you know, it, it, they, they continue, the white supremacy system continues to do the same thing it's always done. So, um, I, and, and also that system's having, happening really multidimensionally. So, you know, it, and, and there's so much work to do on all, the, all those dimensions, you know, just put people changing, people understand, even understanding this, that there's so much work to be done. And um, I, 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 and I, just, I just think that the, it's just really important to um, just always hold the, the systemic nature of this in our, in our minds and hearts, even though we're fo focusing on any, any particular part, whether it's what's happening institutionally, the culture of this place, you know, again, talking to people this, this, um, this, this, this summer, it's just, there's so much despair and, and um, so many people are forgotten in the system the way it's going right now. And so, and I mean, white people too, native, in, indigenous people, you know, it's just so powerful how many people are outside of the, out, outside of any kind of a safe place. And I, somebody in the chat pointed to, to the woman who said, what education is really for? We're not being educated for that. It's like we're, it's, it's, it's not the way education is going right now. So how do we reclaim the work of making sure that we're, that we're, that we, that we're learning, that we're, that we're being educated and what Barbara says that we're, that we're part of a movement, that it's not just our little life, but it's really part of something larger than us. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I think, you know, there's a, <clears throat> uh, there's a way in which there's this other phrase that somebody said in the film, um, said, uh, uh, and this is way back then, so they really don't invest in the neighborhoods. Right? And, and so, I mean, and I think that, that was a, that's, that's a terribly significant observation, right? Because the way, the way, policymakers would have us look at it is that the solution to our problems is for us to land in suburban schools, right? Uh, that, that the pathway to, you know, and, 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 and that solution, although I think it, you know, and again, it's, it's important that, that the schools be open and available and accessible. And it, but, but that very, very policy framework is white supremacy writ large mm -hmm. in all capitals. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm 
and and instead of and as Barbara says, so we we have the money to invest in our neighborhoods, right? But it's a matter of political will. Yes. It's a matter of and economic matter. will because economic you know just the economics of the situation. I was just reading somebody sent me a booking support that said just in just about every major city, like Boston's one of the best because it's comparatively a wealthy city. Thirty something percent of the people in Boston don't make, don't make enough to support a family, and in a lot of big cities, it's fifty. Fifty percent, you know. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. No. It's uh. So you know, I wanted to. I've been. I've been promising everybody that we're going to hear from somebody who was there at Ground Zero. So, so, uh, so, Judge Harris. I think you know. I think you have the ability to unmute yourself. I. I don't know. Let me see. Can we do that, sir? Yeah. There you go. Okay. So, uh, well, welcome, and you know it's always a pleasure to see you. And you know, as you know, you you know, from your esteemed role as a judge, you're always with us in the community, and it, it means it means so much to us. Uh, uh, you know, but hearing this, I'd love to hear a little bit of your perspective on the film and 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 what it's like to see. To did you see yourself in any of those shots? No, oh, I looked for me though, because I was. I was doing taking part. Oh, <laughs> you know, we had the Willis wagon in my grade school. Wow. They took our playground and put the wagon there. Wow. I went to school from eight o'clock in the morning till noon. And then the second shift started from noon to four. So half our friends, we didn't get to play with because they were in school at a different time than us. In the fall of 1963, they came to my high school and said they had a program called the Permissive Transfer Program. They wanted what they call high performing students to transfer to um, what we would call exam schools here. It was Lindblom Technical High School. And they asked me if I would transfer. So I did. I went to Lindblom for one semester. I had a fight every day. The only thing that stopped the fights was I was on the football team and the football team said they couldn't jump on me because I was their backup quarterback and running back. So they would escort me out to school, you know, and we, I took that day off. When we took that day off in the fall of 63 for the March, when I went back to school, I caught hell from the teachers they called me to the office and said, you know, if I ever did that again, they'd expel me, you know, and all this kind of stuff for boycotting that day. But it was an educational, it, I always say I'm a child of the 60s because I became involved. I went with Martin Luther King in 65 to South Deering, Illinois, the most frightening experience I've ever had in my life. Um, Al Raby, I remember him so well because he would be at our church getting us organized to make picket signs and things for the march, different marches. And Mr. Black, Kimmel Black, he's over 100 years old now, and he's still active in Chicago. Now, he's in our high school hall of fame because of his activities, and his, he's a history person, you know? So watching that film, I looked, I saw so many people whose names I recognized. And I remember, you know, the feeling of going on this march. We, I was on the south side, and we marched from the south side downtown. And I just remember the feeling of I'm involved in something. You know, what was that, 15 years old or so? But it made you feel like you were really doing something and taking part in something. And so many of the people who did that stayed in school because um, you saw what you were fighting for. Even though I tried to drop out, my teachers wouldn't let me. <laughs> That's another story. I don't um, know. How about you making trouble, man? I know. <clears throat> you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience for students to be involved in the fight for their own education. That's right. That's right. Right. That's an, you know, one of the most, one of the, another one of those profound things that was said in the film was, uh, that the product 
is the education of going after your education. Yes, sir. That was the product. That and so and you you know sounds like that you know what you just said sounds just like that. That is. So when I came here to Boston in 1970, the reason I met Leon Rock was because they were having a boycott, mm -hmm. and I was one of the teachers at their freedom school. Mm -hmm. I have found an old picture. We both had afros. He had a real big one. <laughs> <laughs> Back in like 1970, uh, you know, or 71. It was the beginning of 71, I believe, that they had their boycott mm -hmm. for the Boston Public Schools, another boycott, yeah. and created freedom schools here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. And I love Miss Robert because she tells the history so well. And I became a member of BEAM because mm -hmm. of their fighting for educational rights. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There was one statement that was made in the film that really moved me. And it is so true. And it was that the students know what is wanted and not given to them. And so these are young people and they can look, they can see, they know. They may not always be able to express it in that context, but that's part of the anger. That's part of the resentment that they feel, you know, when they're attending, you know, our schools. I remember some students at Brighton High School went over to a school in Lexington and they created a film and they came back and uh, they were sharing it and they were, they were comparing what their school looked like and what the school they went to looked like. The, they had a, um, a list of the courses that were offered, all kinds of extracurricular courses and what they had, you know, looking at, you know, two periods of additional math so they can prep for MCAS and English, but not all of those other electives and things that the kids at Lexington has. And so it's really sad that our kids are seeing it, feeling it, experiencing it. And yet we have not found the capacity to, to make it happen for them. And um, I think it's a journey that we've been on. And I think it's a journey that we could see to the end if we can do some of the things that we talked about before. You know, I was really impressed with seeing how the parents in, in uh, Chicago organized and was like uh, on a campaign you know, how many people are at this school today? That reminds me when we have our elections and you want, you're trying to get the tally in. What's the vote in, in district here or district there? I mean, they had it going on as the kids would say. And so it says when we put our minds to something, we can really do it, but we gotta have that staying power to see it through to the end and be relentless in our taking this journey and getting what our kids need. Yeah, I'd like to see if I we, we could maybe bring in another member of the audience. And I don't know if you can uh, unmute Stacy Borden for me, Sarah. Stacy dropped a dropped a long uh, note in the chat, and she she you know she said it was a lecture or something, but it, it wasn't really. But I'd like if we can can and can have because Stacy, uh, you know, I want you to kind of be able to say what you said in the chat, but also speak to the power of organizing. I mean, I think that's what. Um, what Barb is talking about, I think, and that's what the film talks about. And and uh, so I just wonder if, if you could share a little bit about, you know, the organizing that you are doing and your experience um, uh, in school. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for having me here. I, you know, I, I'm not a. Um, I say this all the time. I don't speak in academic language. I just speak from my feelings. Was so overwhelmed watching this film and then listening to Barbara. You know, when I when I I just started writing. My feelings were so overwhelmed. You know, coming from JP High and coming out of you know the Orchard Park area up to Dorchester and growing up in my household and dealing with all the trauma, the trauma that I'd seen and the trauma that was um, pressed upon me growing up and trying to navigate through the system, the Boston public school system was horrible, it was traumatic in itself. And watching this film, every time I 
I often think about Diane Wilkerson. I remember I was probably 17 or 18 and I read an article about her coming from the South and the fights that happened. And I felt this immense feeling that I wish that I was there in those times. It's almost like my spirit was there, but I never knew how to navigate it in the presence. And even today, I remember watching this film. I heard this woman say they told her she couldn't be a scientist. That, that happened to me just recent, 10 years ago, coming out of prison in 2010 by a probation officer saying that I couldn't achieve anything. I wasn't, I wanted to go to college. I made a promise to the girls that I was going to get out and do something different because we have such a lack of resources and opportunities in our community. I'm 59, just coming into that information because I lived in the darkness so long. And in that chat that I wrote was, you know, I, I just couldn't find any direction. I didn't have it coming from the school system, connecting me to me. Even the woman who said that, like school gives you the education, but it also gives you the creativity to become something more than what you could possibly dream of. And so I challenged that probation officer. I wouldn't say her name today because now she, in turn, when I did get into college, she allowed me to come back and cancel my probation and let me hold her child. That was big. But I'm like, is that really big? I'm a human being. I should be able to hold your child, no matter what my past was. Encourage me to become something different and bigger. And so when you said that, David, I, I do. I belong to a, a beautiful, huge movement in Boston, part of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, led by Andrea James, who also founded Families for Justice as Healing. Phenomenal work, phenomenal movement and policy change, phenomenal work with um, the criminal justice system, the injustice system, phenomenal work with helping and cultivate new beginners reentry services, which I'm the founder of, and really taking all these elements, David, that you often bring us into the world of education, connection of what we're doing today, and really bringing that into the realm of new beginners reentry services for women coming out of prison so we can help them dream and cultivate and know that. For the past 10 years, I just had one dream, one way of thinking, I'm going to help these girls. I made a decision to them because they raised me in prison, not the system. The injustice is to put us in a cage to think that that's going to train us to do something different. A whole bunch of us, 100,000 or more black and brown people sitting in them cages being punished because you didn't give us the opportunity and took away the resources. Even today, May, 2020, they decided to take art and music out of the school system. They started with Randolph into the Boston Public Schools. How do you do that to a being? What you're really saying is what Donna said, white supremacy is so prevalent. I often think why do we have Black Lives Matter? Why do we keep on having a fight that we're Black and we should have something and have an opportunity? Thank you, Black Lives Matter. I love that. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that movement. But why do we have to keep fighting to be seen and heard and be given what's rightfully right for everybody? The equality that the word equity I'm like, what does equity mean? Doesn't that mean equality? I'm like, why do we keep changing words? It's confusing me from somebody who had a lack of education. Like, let's just talk some real talk. And so, you know, when I think back and look at that, that, um, that movie and I think about my own family, my brother who's a year older than me that had an opportunity to go to Metco, beautiful. He's so successful, successful from his work and education and family his children. And here I was struggling to understand life and myself and family and, and community. I went into the street and ended up in a cage watching white men in the community school system degrade us, 
watching them sneak girls into the bathroom. It was horrible and traumatizing. And this is still happening today. And the only way that we can change it is to keep fighting and keep having these movements and keep reaching out as Judge Harris reached out. Thank you, Judge Harris, for allowing me into that space of creating more reentry programs for people coming out of prison. Thank you for having these community meetings so we can continue to grow. We are the ones that can create the change we see in these communities. I, Andrea James says it all the time, we can't keep relying on them to give us what we need in these communities. And so that's the movement we belong to. We're not going to stop. I had a big fight with, you know, the system with trying to open up Kimia's house. We named it after a young woman that's sitting in the cage that was my um, cellmate who should have never gotten a 20 year sentence after being um, violated at 12 years old and being a victim in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office and then becoming a defendant 20 years later coming from substance abuse and trauma being attempted rape again. So these are the conversations that we need to talk about. These are the movements that we need to continue to, to grow. And Sharon Hinton, I'm with you. I'm ready to march. Like, let's get the school board out of the system and into our hands and into our community. So I'm here, y'all. Yeah, Thank you for so letting much. me speak. Thank you so much. No, no, I mean, this is part of, this is what, you know, this is, this is all about education. I mean, you know, Charles Hamilton Houston said, all our struggles must tie in together. You can't separate this out, right? It's not like, uh, it's not like a separate thing, you know? Uh, and I, I have to say, you know, Stacy. I mean, you, you know, you said it. You know, connecting me to me, right? That's what you know. That's a powerful piece of education, right? And that's something that that is withheld from from so many of our students, right? The the me inside is connected by is, is disconnected. So, uh, so you know, what, and you segue into another question th that came out of the chat, uh, and and and. And it, and it has to do with, with METCO. I mean, Stacy, your story is an important one, right? I mean, you know, so here you have two siblings, you know, who, who are given two different pathways, right? Um, and, you know, so I just was, was curious what our thought, I mean, we mentioned Jean McGuire earlier, you know, um, and Judge Harris, I know you've been involved in, in, in METCO. So how do we, how do we, how do we think about the kind of the medco option in relation to our needs. I mean, talk to us a little bit about that. Somebody. I I was the director for the Melrose Medco. I was the first director there, mm -hmm. and Jean McGuire asked me to do it. I gave her a two year commitment because I was not a real believer in medco, and that was probably from my experience going to. Um, Lynn Bloom Technical High School for that one semester. But I saw our children having to get up extra early in the morning. Um, and as they got older, they were not a part of their own community so often. Now, my kids went to Metco, but they left. One son left, one stayed. Um, I have mixed feelings about Metco. It's a wonderful opportunity for some kids. You know, and I, I don't blame parents for looking for alternatives. But if you're going to put your child in one of these school systems, you better be there too. You know, um, so many of the parents that I had were working and could not come to the school. So they relied on me as the MEDCO director and the bus monitors to protect their children and to address the needs of their kids. Melrose was one of the better systems, I do believe. Um, they had a social worker assigned to work with Metco students from the school system, you know, who came into town. We had one kid who was coming to school with no clothes on, basically, in the wintertime. And we went to their house, and they were sleeping on the floor uh, one, in one apartment in a four-family or six-family house, the only apartment that was occupied. And there were dogs in there. I mean, it was just horrible. But she worked with me to move them to a different, with the help of the bowling family, because they had real estate, we were able to move them to a different location. But I still have mixed feelings. We shouldn't have to send our children outside to get an education. 
we should be able to have them in our schools getting a quality education with teachers who look like them. So that's basic my feeling. I'm not a I'm not against Manco. I'm just not I'm not an advocate for it. So I just want to piggyback yeah. uh, because I agree wholeheartedly with what Judge Harris is saying. Um, I was, you know, in Boston Public Schools in central administration dealing with equity issues. And I used to ride back and forth every day to work with Dr. Catherine Ellison, who was in charge of the Department of Implementation, which was the arm uh, of the court dealing with how students are assigned to schools. And so we were, all, we were often talking as we were driving back and forth. And I was always amazed at the number of students who left Boston or were assigned outside of Boston who ended up coming back into Boston. Those kids who could not, you know, handle Metco or it wasn't just Metco, it was also the charter schools when they first opened up. We found with the charter schools when it was time for the MCAS, we get a flux of kids who would come from the charters back into Boston public. And the teachers would complain because they associated with the whole MCAS taking the tests and test scores. And of course, Boston gets a, a bum rap for it. Some of it deserves, some not. But I think there's a creaming that goes on. And I think it happens with kids who go to Metco, who don't fit into um, what they're looking for for students. It happens in Boston's pilot schools. It happens in our exam schools. And it also happens in uh, the charter schools. And so I think there's a need to be able to educate all children. And I think some children are able to assimilate better. Some students, some students, um, you know, every child is different. And some children need to know who they are. They need to have, all kids need to know their history and from whence they come. And they need to know that within them, you know, our kings and queens and all of that. And some kids who do not get that and receive that, and they are like that young man said in the film, um, I know what I want and it's not given to me. Those kids who start feeling that, then they start responding in a different way. And the next thing we know, they're on that uh, school to prison pipeline that Judge Harris has fought against so desperately all these years. So I think we have to also take that into consideration when we're deciding where our kids are going and what you know they, they can deal with in different environments, whether it's a culture, an environment that's going to uh, help support them or if it's one that's gonna tear them down and they're forever trying to fight against it. So I think it's a, a lot for parents to consider. Where's the best place to put your child? And the judge is right. Parents shouldn't have to make that decision because all of our school environments, especially our public schools, should be able to educate our children. And you're probably tired of hearing me make that saying, should be able to educate our children. But it's so true because I believe the schools have, I think, I think that most schools have the knowledge to do so, but I don't think they have the will nor do I think they value the kids that are within them enough to do what they need to do to make it happen. One of the things that I saw as a judge sitting in the juvenile court was kids who went to the charter schools and to sometimes suburban schools. They were back in November, December, back into the Boston public schools. And it always felt like once the schools got the money for that kid, they didn't need that kid anymore. And, or if the kid had any special need. Right. You know, they didn't want to spend the money on the special needs child. So we would get them back into Boston. And then when they went into the Boston public schools, if they had any issue, they were brought in front of a judge instead of being dealt with at the school. Mm -hmm. You know, I was one of those kids. My mother came up to school two or three times a week for me. Only both. 
So if I were going to school now, I'd have a long record because they would have called the cops, not my mother. Might have been easier, but. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you want to say anything? I was going to ask uh, Sharon Hinton to speak in a minute, but no, I just I totally agree with that, and I think that I think there's some for me there's something about the culture and and black culture and black educational culture because I know that how I was taught, which was by black teachers, primarily by black teachers, was that everybody learned. It was like everybody swim. Everybody learns. Like you, you, put, you didn't have an excuse, and you weren't put up. You weren't put on a pedestal because you did better or whatever. It was like everyone had a high. There was a high standard for everyone. And the other thing was so that ranking. But the other thing was um, that I think we've taken from um, white culture is that that all the t everybody has to be alike. You know, the the whole thing of all teachers have to be alike. And in fact. You know, I had a diversity of black teachers and some could speak to some some students and others could speak to others. You know, it wasn't like everybody had to be just alike. So there's things about how we sort of breathe in the white way of being. Um, not that it's not bad, maybe it's good for them, but it doesn't work for us in a lot of cases is another thing that keeps coming up for me as we think about how education changes. I've seen it in... You know, when I was visiting schools working on the project, the black teachers had the same standards. You know, they, 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 and a lot of kids that don't have, haven't had black teachers think they're being hard on them because the white teachers don't demand as, as much of them. So, you know, that's another thing that's, that's really changed a lot and getting back to, or at least comp being, com being talking about the value system around how you educate people. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's important. Then. So, so Sharon, are you? I think are, are you unmuted now? I certainly am, my brother. I I thank you for this space, Sister yeah. Stacy. You gave a link to Leon, who gave the link to me, and I was actually supposed to be um, testifying tonight again in front of the Boston School Committee, and and that's not one of my superpowers, being in two or three places at the same time. I want to give honor to Judge Harris. Who I worked together with on the People's Academy in Dorchester, the, the Black led um, by a genius and a creative genius, T. Michael Thomas in the People's Academy Technical Vocational School, and Judge Harris's part in securing that land finally on Warren Street in Dorchester. I want to give honor to my sister in the struggle, Stacey Borden. You are kicking it, girl. You are killing it, queen. And Andrea James, she's a bad. And Sister Barbara Fields, who has been in there forever with Bean, and I've heard her testify, and she's no joke. She's quiet spoken, but she's quiet fire. And Donna Bivens, you and I have worked together in that space, the healing and uh, space uh, on Washington Street. That's for Black people to come and just be. And last but not least, um, one of the greatest Black men I've ever known in my life, um, King Leon Rock. Um, I, I, I just have to give him props because I, I know him, I've known him since he, we fought together shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, Columbia Point, the Boston schools. Um, and he is the reason why the dream that I had six years ago at Black Teachers Matter is not now a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So I have to give credit while y'all are still here and you can still smell the flowers and the roses. I don't wanna talk about y'all at the funeral after you've gone and you can't appreciate it. <laughs> So I appreciate this space, but what I had put into the chat, my father was one of the original people that formed Operation Exodus that became MECO. Mm. And one of the reasons why he parted ways with beloved Jean McGuire, I love her, she's like one of my mamas, and Ruth Batson is because he believed from the very beginning that MECO should only be a short-term remedy while we built our own school systems. I attended the Topographical Center, the Black After School Program, I know about the Sister Claire Muhammad School, the Freedom Schools, I attended those. Um, but the best teacher I had was my father. He was the one in the home that esteemed education so highly that when he was assassinated, when I was 13 and I was ninth grader at Beaver Country Day School, a school I only attended because my dad wanted us to excel. And he gave my brothers and I the opportunities to choose schools. My brothers were shown Thompson Academy 
on the island. And, and uh, they said, no, we're not going any place. We got to take a boat to get to. And so they went to English high school and I went to Beaver Country Day where I learned the language of wealth around people who had money, still have money, never saw a time when they wouldn't have money and their money still has money. So that in itself was a learning environment. But I remember feeling like Judge Harris said that um, I didn't belong. I knew I belonged academically because I was always in advanced classes. I was always on the honor roll. And when you know, I was given the opportunity to go to this school where there were five black students in there and two of us didn't wanna be black. And that wasn't me, but two black people didn't wanna be black. It was all female, all wealthy, uh, mostly white um, prep school. Everybody assumed they were going to college. That was the environment. And I saw them without the, when I say them, Beaver Country Day School and the administration and the parents um, that didn't have to justify getting a teacher or getting a curriculum or setting up a learning um, environment for their particular individual student. It wasn't about they had to justify the numbers to get someone to teach a particular uh, class or particular focus. I mean, our Spanish class went to Mexico. You feel me? So it was like, yep, we taught you Spanish. So now you're gonna go and you're gonna check it out. Um, my art teacher um, was from Germany because at that time, you know, I mean, I I'm not that old in terms of World War II, but he was one of the German uh, professors because he was Jewish, couldn't stay in Germany. And so where a lot of them went down south because they were still Jewish and up north didn't want him either, uh, he was a professor that taught me so many things about art. And so I looked at the difference and I still look at the difference between a Beaver Country Day School and an entitled wealthy school and I've taught in every last one of them. I've taught in private schools. I've taught in undergrad and graduate. I've taught in middle school and high school and elementary school in the Boston public schools. And I've taught in charter schools. We need to have our own schools. This system will never, never, never teach us to be who we really are because that's, you know, people talk about the schools are broken. No, they're doing exactly what they're designed to do. They continue to support white supremacy and oppress black indigenous people of color, black and brown and indigenous people of color. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And so my father was right because 50 years later, and I just saw one of these statistics last night, in 2021, 1% of SPED students and 0.2% of ELL students are in the three exam schools, Boston Latin Academy, Boston Latin School, and the John O'Brien. And our kids are told that they have to excel but they still get tracked at the John O'Brien, not a BLS that has $60 million worth of money, $60 million of endowment money that they don't share with anybody else. And this elitist sense of entitlement that my kid, and, and let me be clear, it is not just white parents and Asian parents that think their kids are special because they got into the exam schools. There's some other Negro peons on the plantation that are thinking that way too. And they're being used by other people that don't want all of our kids to have that advantage. And so right now there is a discussion and a task force that is getting together to decide if the exam schools, which were the exams for the exam schools, which were eliminated this year because of the pandemic, these people are getting together and putting their money together to reinstitute the exams in the exam schools to support this white supremacist elitist kind of um, system. Three schools for their kids, and the Asian parents are sucking up to it. And I've heard them make comments about our kids that the only thing they didn't say was that our kids are stupid, but they put it in every other way to say that. Well, we can't help it if they don't value education as much as we do. We can't help it if they don't study hard like we do. I'm hearing this, okay? And the only thing that's missing is the hoods and the smoking crosses, I'm telling you. This is happening now. The discussion about elected versus appointed school committee in Boston is happening now it's being decided now and so you know i look at <laughs> the eyes on the prize kind of video from tonight and it's powerful but it, but it <laughs> it makes me sick and it makes me tired and realize how tired i am of fighting this i was in the school department working in the school department when south boston information center took it over and was in there um giving the black students and black parents the wrong assignments to prove that busing didn't work I saw what they were doing from the inside. I still what they're doing, see what they're doing from the inside. And I tried to get into the school committee twice. 
And the boy that they put in there now is a white boy from East Boston who's a lawyer of a health center who has nothing to do with education. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And so when I sit there and fight and over 400 people emailed and called the mayor, Mayor Marty Walsh, who said, who said that white supremacy and racism is a health hazard. Yeah, we know, I'm black. I know it's a health hazard for me. What are you gonna do, Marty, when it's less than half of 1% of the money, the millions of dollars that are coming in from the FEMA money is not going to black businesses when you're keeping the black communities poor? I mean, come on now. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my voice is so passionate. I'm so upset because the fact that I'm looking at this in the 60s, and I remember from the 50s, Leon and I have been putting together a timeline of the educators. And I was talking to somebody today about the educators just in Boston. We're bad as hell and we've been bad as hell and why we keep putting ourselves in these systems and not dismantling these systems that are only designed to steal, kill and destroy us. I can't keep doing it. I'm not gonna keep shuffling chairs on the deck of the Titanic. And so Black Teachers Matter, this organization, we're out there. We're handing out PPE to save teachers. We're giving them N95 masks because they're being mandated to go back into schools that don't give a damn about their life and the families that they're coming to, bringing back COVID. We're giving shields to teachers and the students who are special needs students, high needs students, because they have to see each other's faces. We have what we need to do, what we have to do. And I can't keep, I'm like, I, I gotta get off the plantation. I gotta get off the plantation. I was gonna be free. I can't do this. And I thank you for showing this, this video. Uh, Judge Harris, um, I saw T. Michael, we were talking today. I didn't see him, we, I see him when I'm talking to him. We were talking this morning about this amazing stuff that is happening. And the fact that elected officials that know about him, that could be funneling millions of dollars to him for what he's doing, freeing black people upsets me because I hear people pat themselves on the back saying they're supporting him. And I know that they're not. This double talking time is over. Sister, um, Barbara Fields with Beam, I see you. I've seen you in these meetings. You know, and Stacy, I had to sign, we had to sign a letter of support when a black elected official, you're not gonna say it, but I'm gonna say it, came out against what you're doing in that re-entry home. And, and, and now she's running for mayor. Okay, so I said who it was, you figure it out. You figure it out. You figure it out. We have to call, and I'm not hating on my people now. And I'm not hating on anybody else. I love my people. I love me. So this moment tonight, I really need it. Because sometimes some of the people that look like us, they have our kin, they have our skin, but they ain't kin. And they have our skin, but they ain't kin. And I look, I think I saw Bernie, I think I saw Bernie Sanders in that film that you showed tonight. Honest to God, I think I saw him. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but it looked like I saw Bernie Sanders. But the point is, I saw a whole lot of young black folks that are now older. They're now older and we're still talking about the same thing. Are you for real? Uh, Malcolm X, last thing, only an enemy, would only a fool will allow his enemy to educate his children. These people, I'm not talking about the individual white teachers because we have too many, too high a percentage of white teachers teaching our kids that come there especially in the charter schools, to get their student loans forgiven after they work for three years in certain schools. And then you go to the suburban schools and they don't even have to be certified and they don't have the experience. And that's who's teaching our kids in the most troubled schools. Let's call it what it really is. And it needs to be called out. We need more people that have the courage to say what it is and to change it instead of just going, oh, well, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, we had it. No, no, no. That kumbaya stuff, that's over. I'm done. I'm done. So thank you for allowing me to speak. And, and I honor my ancestors that came before me that were teachers. I honor you that are in this room that are doing this work, the real allies that are doing this work. I thank you for that. Thank you. David, at some point we should talk about the uh, community schools, Highland Park Preschool, New School for Children, Roxbury Community School and their creation and talk about why they didn't survive. Mm -hmm. But now's the time. I mean, I think, you know, there's, you know, the thing that's so obvious is, you know, I think everybody has said, you know, the, the, the film is on one level inspiring and, and on another level just incredibly depressing, right? Um, to, to, to think about the amount of time. Barbara, you know, when we did the Brown at 65, I, I said, um, 
I said our, our understanding of Brown v. Board of Education, um, that uh, separate but equal, uh, it, it, it will not work in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, the, you know, the full sentence is separate but equal cannot work in this country in the United States because of racism. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about separate, separate but equal that's fundamentally incompatible. It, it's the fact that in this country, uh, black people will never be given the resources that white people are given. Mm -hmm. And and that if you so I mean that's this, that's the story of Metco that's the story of of housing that's the story of people saying we know what makes for a good community let's open up our our suburbs for people well if we know what makes for a good community let's make our all our you know let's make all our communities whole right uh, but but there isn't the political will so so Ms Hinton I agree with you you know how we and and you know the thing is there's some this. Uh, uh, Muhammad, you know, I appreciate your comment because, you know, many of us who are on this right now are tired or angry. Right? <laughs> and, I, and I look at your comment and, and it actually, it, it actually gives me some hope because, you know, if you take from this viewing a, a, a determination, if it increases your determination, then, then we have really accomplished something here, right? Um, because we really need people stepping up. Um, you know, we can celebrate all the rest of us old folks on this call, um, um, but, but we need folks like you stepping up. So Judge Harris, if you wanna talk a little bit about that, I think, you know, we could, there we go, thank you. I, it's good to see you, man, okay? <laughs> all right, you come out from behind that screen, man. All right, good, thank you. I taught for three years in the community schools. That was my first job. Um, coming out of grad school. I taught one year at New School for Children and two years at Highland Park. Those I taught third and fourth grade. Those children are now 58, 59 years old, you know, but they're still a part of my life. You know, I have met their children and in some cases their grandchildren because that was the difference in teaching at a community school. I lived around the corner from the school. Um, I got there at seven o'clock in the morning and didn't leave until midnight because it became a home. And there's a difference when you feel at home at a school. One of the things that I didn't learn until I was an adult, we had three Tuskegee Airmen as high school teachers at my high school. When you talked about one of the teachers being harder on you than anybody else, Mr. Wilson, uh, calculus and trigonometry, he was hard. But now I understand why, you know, and we need to understand that the community schools, poor people couldn't pay tuition. So we had to do fundraising, grant writing to keep the schools afloat. When Ford Foundation and others changed their focus, the schools died because they couldn't get the money. Um, when I started teaching, they offered me 8,500. Mm -hmm. I got there on my first day, they cut it to 8,000. In um, January, I started getting $25 a week because they would, didn't have the money, but I couldn't leave my kids. You know, I lost my apartment, thought I was going to be homeless. G. McGuire got me a place with a guy named Henry Hampton. I lived in his house. But that was the struggle. You didn't have the funds to run the school the way we should have. Now we could call it a charter school or whatever and get some money. I just would love to see that recreated. That's where you learned in Guzu Saba. That's where you learned um, to speak because all my kids stood up and spoke in class, you know, and the students taught each other. All my kids love black poetry because I love the black poetry. You know, they know who Langston Hughes and Paula Dunbar and County Colony folks are. And we need to find a way to recreate that. We had a school at my church, mm -hmm. but again, money, yeah. you know, trying to pay the bills. It was 
untenable. But thank you. No, thank you. I, you know, and, and I want us to, I, I'm going to have to wrap soon, but I, I wanted us to, uh, Leon, do you want to talk? Do you want to say something now? Let's see if we can get you unmiked or miked. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi. 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 I know this is late and uh, it's time to wrap up, but I'll tell you, this was an experience of all experiences for me uh, because it was so important because uh, in Boston, I led the um, 1971 Black student boycott of the city of Boston schools. And it was the exact same experiences as everyone has said that led me and others to come together to say, you know what, the school system is crazy. We got to do something. There is only 17 black teachers in the whole school system. We could name them. The school committee was run by segregationists. I remember going into um, a school um, a meeting with um, uh, uh, John Kerrigan, um, a school committee member, after the student boycott began in Boston. The first thing he said to me was, listen here, uh, Leon, I don't know who you, th and he, this is a closed door meeting. I don't know who you think you are, but we're not allowing, and I'm sorry, excuse the language, we're not allowing you niggers to come and make decisions for us. You little young niggers to come and make decisions for us regarding the school system. We know what we're doing. And hold on a second, he brought in Louise Day Hicks. Yes, and Louise said essentially the same thing. So when I'm, I'm hearing all this and I'm hearing my good friend, my brother, um, my brother, Judge Harris, and we met, as you said, Judge Harris, in 1971 during that student boycott where the um, BEAM and the other organizations were coming together to support Black students as we addressed racism. Color aroused hatred and was so vivid, so clear. I remember sharing as we went up to, um, uh, uh, to um, South Boston and who was, who was revving it up as well was who became mayor of Boston. And he, along with let me tell you, had to be about 10,000 voices. As we came up with the buses, as bus monitors, they yelled at us, nigger go home, nigger in chorus for half an hour. That was it. And Ray Flynn was leading the effort. So when I'm hearing and seeing all this. It was so vivid, um, so insightful, because I learned something that was really important today, and that was when one of the one of the people being interviewed talked about um, Chicago being a leader. Clearly, Chicago was a leader. The Great Migration up to Chicago from the south. And then the great migration back down to the South to support their brothers and sisters. So I, sal I salute you, brother, doctor, um, uh, um, uh, judge Harris. You're the best. You're the awesomeness. And I remember one other thing. I got to say this. I got to say this. Is I didn't know the challenge that you were going through economically when you were staying there solid with uh, New School for Children. But now I remember, because I used to visit you in certain places that you worked and we had long discussions. And so I remember now how you were pulling together your economic pieces. And guess what? Um, Chicago school system didn't stop you because you became a judge. 
in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I salute you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know, people. I I got I I got to thank everybody. I, I you know, and and the thing is, what we have to do again. There 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 remains the challenge before us, right? And and that is how to do, Stacy. I mean, everybody. You know how you know going forward. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to kind of tie another little piece of history together here because somebody mentioned the South Boston Information Center. And, you know, we hear a lot of talk today about the seaport mm -hmm. and what the seaport looks like now. And we need to understand that we need to remember that it was originally called what? It was called the South Boston Seaport. All right. That's what they wanted to call it the South Boston Seaport. And why did they want to call it that? They wanted to call it that because the South Boston Information Center wanted to get all the community benefits that came from the construction and they wanted to annex the seaport as part of South Boston. They wanted to annex it with all of that racist structure, right? And if so, we, we, a few of us sued the city to prevent them from getting those benefits. And they dropped the name, they dropped the South Boston part, and it died down for a few years. And then it rose back up, this great white wonder. Right? And that's because there was no, inf there was no organizing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. to stop it yeah mm -hmm. and, and 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 now and now we wring our hands and we say oh my god how did it get to be like this well it got to be like this they knew and they waited mm -hmm. and they waited and they sprung it okay. and so you know the point is stacy i'm gonna come back to you i mean i think that the the the, the, the need to be doing organizing whether whether it's to create a create our own school system, <laughs> you know, or to survive within this one. Um, the, the need to organize is paramount. Um, and so, Barbara, I'm going to look to you to kind of take us out on some, some concrete action. What, what, if there was one thing, you know, that you, you were going to say to us, you want us to do, to get behind, to do, to act, what would it be? I think it would be to get connected, to be informed. One good thing about Zoom is you can sit in your house <laughs> and you can know what's going on, whether it's at the city council, the school committee, uh, through different organizations. I mean, I get emails all the time and I'm on Zoom more than I really care to be on it, but I have this need for knowledge. And so I wanna know what's going on because you need to be informed to know how you want to move and move effectively. So, I mean, there are organizations such as BEAM where we're doing advocacy and uh, we are on the website and we will, you know, organize to go to a school committee, Good. you know, and now you can do that on Zoom to push back against some of these racist policies. Now, all of a sudden, it's going to be an anti-racist school district. So then we need to hold them accountable to some of that rhetoric right. that they talk. As Sharon said, they're looking at the whole exam school policy again. There was a meeting on the achievement opportunity gap uh, task force that we made them put together back in 2006. So they did talk about using the word achievement and it should be just opportunity. So there's some dialogue about that. So I get that. But the issue is, what are the outcomes that we're seeing as it relates to our children getting those opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me, and being able, you know, to benefit from what is within the district, even access, access to programs and all of that. So you can even, you know, go on the school department um, uh, website. And they have all of these things that you can read, these meetings you could go to. And if you're not one to go to a lot of meetings, even if you're looking at your, 
your uh, local newspapers. There's a big fight going on now at the State Board of Education around access to vocational, the regional vocational schools at Madison Park because the unions now are saying, we can't get any workers because the kids who are having access now to the regional vocational schools are kids who are wealthier from affluent communities because they want to go there because the MCAS scores are high. You know, they know that they can get, you know, uh, into these colleges and universities. And so now the businesses don't have any laborers, so to speak, because the kids are going and benefiting from the vocational technical programs. They're going to college. So they're saying well, only 20% of the kids who are coming out of the vocational schools are working in the trades and fields. And some of them make some pretty good money, you know, and our kids could benefit that given the wealth gap that we have. So that's something that you could watch on, on Zoom. You could write a letter, you could make a phone call, you could get on the commission and say, open those schools up. And the criteria should not be looking at your discipline record, your grades, your attendance, your tardiness. We know all of those things have a disparate impact. You know, so the kids aren't able to access the programs. So that's going on now. Also with the testing. You know, there's so many ways in which you can influence what's happening to our kids. And so I would just ask that people, you know, connect in whatever way you can. And let's try to get organized, you know, so that we can really advocate for our kids because everybody can't go into a private school if that's your choice because they can't get in there either with the criteria so many of our kids so public schools is where our children are going to be and we care about all of them we're a family you know our future is tied to their future then i would say just get connected get involved we need thank you. you thank you thank you and donna Take us out. No, oh, I think it's all been said. I, I, I think it's all been said. We just uh, have to keep showing up for each other. No, yeah, no. Yeah. So, and then, you're, you're ahead, closing out. can we give a shout out to Vivian and Willard Johnson? Yes. Who yes. This? yes. You know, I'm so listening in there, so I know. I know. <laughs> yes. We, 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 we've been pleased. We, a shout and, and, and great thanks, right? for sure. Yes. <laughs> Go. All right. Mm -hmm. That's a, you all, you all want to say, share a few words with us? Somebody, can you unmute them, Sarah? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much for this opportunity to see the, the film. I was born in Chicago and have mm -hmm. lots of relatives there. Uh, Leslie and I have talked about this at various times, but it is true. And I, I hope that there will be a film of this kind made about the Boston experience because that history also needs to be kept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah well, we know, you know, Donna did some work on this, some, some of this and uh, you know, I think there is a there is a bigger project that you know that, that we need to, to think about. Um, I'm glad there is. Yeah. I'm very glad yeah. to hear it. Yeah. Um, and thank you all for all of your work. It has it has not gone unnoticed, and there are many children who have profited thereby. And as everyone has said, it's simply that we must keep up the same struggle. Thank well, you both for yours. Yeah. yeah been, they're leading the way. I can't think of a better note for us to, to, you know, if we have to part, which I, you know, I kind of, you know, I'm hungry, so I'll go eat. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but thank no, you, David. Seriously, you know, this is, this is, this is why we do this work. This is why, you know, we, we try to connect. This is important. And, you know, and, it's not like we're in the same room and, and have that, but but there's a there's a feeling here among us I think that's really important and I really appreciate. And so I just want to 
everybody to know that it it, it, it sustains me uh, and, and I'm thankful for it. So, uh, Thank you. so with that, I guess we'll, we'll sign off and, uh, and, and hope that you'll continue to come to these series. You can visit our website to see the listing of the films coming up. Uh, and, um, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you for Thank your you. leadership. Okay. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.